Mary Slusser of Calabar, Pioneer Missionary by W.P. Livingston. Chapter 4 Taming the Roughs. In her church work, she continued to find the little distraction from toil which gave life its savor. She began to attend the Sabbath morning fellowship and weeknight prayer meetings. She also taught a class of lovable lassies in the Sabbath school. I had the impudence of ignorance then in a special degree, surely, was her mature comment on that, and became a distributor of the monthly visitor. Despite the weary hours in the factory and a long walk to and from the church, she was never absent from any of the services or meetings. We would as soon have thought of going to the moon as of being absent from her servants, she wrote shortly before she died, and we throw very well on it too. How often, when lying awake at night, my time of thinking, do I go back to those wonderful days? She owed much to her association with the church, but more to her Bible. Once a girl asked her for something to read, and she handed her the Bible, saying, Take that. It has made me a changed lassie. The study of it was less a duty than a joy. It was like reading a message addressed especially to herself, containing news of surpassing personal interest and import. God was very real to her. To think that behind all the strain and struggle and show of the world, there was a personality, not a thought or dream, not something she could not tell what, in spaces she not, knew not where, but one who was actual and close to her, overflowing with love and compassion, and ready to listen to her, and to heal and guide and strengthen her. It was marvelous. She wished to know all he had to tell her, in order that she might rule her conduct according to his will. Most of all, it was the story of Christ that she pored over and thought about, his divine majesty, the beauty and grace of his life, the pathos of his death on the cross, affected her inexpressibly. But it was his love, so strong, so tender, so pitiful, that won her heart in devotion, and filled her with a happiness and peace that suffused her inner life like sunshine. In return, she loved him with a love so intense that it was often a pain. She felt that she could not do enough for one who had done so much for her. As the years passed, she surrendered herself more and more to his influence, and was ready for any duty she was called upon to do for him, no matter how humble or exacting it might be. It was this passion of love and gratitude, this abandonment of self, this longing for service, that carried her into her life work. Weisheart Church stood in the midst of slums. Pens, or arched passages, led from the cowgate into tall tenements, with outward spiral stairs which opened upon a maze of landings and homes. Out of these sunless rookeries tides of young life poured by, night and day, and spread over the neighboring streets in undisciplined freedom. She volunteered as a teacher, and so began a second period of STEM training, which was to serve her well in the years to come. The wilder spirits made sport of the meetings and endeavored to wreck them. That little room, she wrote, was full of romantic experiences. There was danger outside when the staff separated, and she recalled how several of the older men surrounded the smaller individuals when they faced the storm. One of these was Mr. J. H. Smith, who became her warm friend and counselor. As the mission developed, a shop under the church at the side of Wiseheart Pend was taken, and the meetings transferred to it, she having charge of classes for boys and girls, both on Sunday and weeknights. Open-air work was at that time dangerous, but she and a few others attempted it. They were opposed by roughs and pelted with mud. There was one gang that was resolved to break up the mission with which she had come to be identified. One night, they closed in or about her on the street. The leader carried a leaden weight at the end of a piece of cord and swung it threateningly round his head. She stood her ground. Nearer and nearer the missile came. It shaved her brow. She never winced. The weight crashed to the ground. She's game boys, he exclaimed. To show their appreciation of her spirit, they went in a body to the meeting. 
there, her bright eyes, her sympathy, her firmness, shaped them into order and attention. On the wall of one of her bush houses in West Africa, there used to hang a photograph of a man and his wife and family. The man was the lad who had swung the lead. On attaining a good position, he had sent her the photograph, in grateful remembrance of what had been a turning point in his life. Another lad, a bully, used to stand outside the hall with a whip in hand, driving the young fellows into Mary Slusser's meeting, but refused to go in himself. One day the girl weaver faced him. "'If we changed places, what would happen?' she asked. And he replied, "'I would get this whip across my back.' She turned her back. "'I'll bear it for you, if you'll go in,' she said. "'Would you really bear that for me?' "'Yes, and far more. Go on, I mean it.' He threw down the whip and followed her in, and gave himself the same day to Christ. Even then she was unconventional in her methods, and was criticized for it. She had a passion for the countryside, and often on Saturday afternoons she would take her class of lads away, out to the green fields, regardless of social canons. By and by a new field of work was opened up, when a number of progressive minds in the city formed Victoria Street United Presbyterian Congregation, not far from her familiar haunts. In connection with the movement, a mission service for the young was started on Sunday mornings, under the presidency of Mr. James Logic, of Tay Square Church, and to him Mary offered her services as a monitor. Mr. Logic soon noticed the capacity of the young assistant, and won her confidence and regard. Like most people, she was unconscious at the moment of the unseen forces molding her life, but she came in after days to realize the wise ordering of this friendship. Mr. Logic became interested in her work and ideals, and sought to promote her interest in every way. She came to trust him implicitly. "'He is the best earthly friend I have,' she wrote and he guided her henceforward in all her money affairs. She was as successful with the lads at this service as she had been elsewhere. Before the meeting she would flit through the dark passages in the tenements and knock, and rouse them up from sleep, and plead with them to turn out to it. Her influence over them was extraordinary. They adored her, and gave her shy allegiance, and the result was seen in changed habits and transformed lives. It was the same in the houses she visited. She went there not as one who was superior to the inmates, but as one of themselves. In the most natural way she would sit down by the fire and nurse a child, or take a cup of tea at the table. Her sympathy, her delicate tact, her cheery counsel, won many a woman's heart, and braced her for higher endeavor. It was the same in the factory. Her influence told on the workers about her. Some she strengthened others she won over to Christ, and these created an atmosphere which was felt throughout the building. And yet, what was she? Only a working girl, plain in appearance and in dress, diffident and self-effacing. But, says one, whom she used to take down as a boy to the mission, and place beside her as she taught, she possessed something that we could not grasp, something indefinable. It was the glow of the Spirit of Christ which lit up her inner life, and shone in her face, and which, unknown even to herself, was then and afterwards the source of her distinction and her power. Chapter 5. Self-Culture For fourteen years, and these the freshest and fairest years of her life, she toiled in the factory for ten hours each full day, while she also gave faithful service in the mission and yet she continued to find time for the sedulous culture of her mind. She was always borrowing books and extracting what was best in them. Not all were profitable. One was The Rise and Progress of Religion in the Soul by Philip Doddridge, a volume much pondered then in Scottish homes. A friend who noticed that she was somewhat cast down said to her, Why, Mary, what's the matter? You look very glum. I cannot do it, she replied. Cannot do what? I cannot meditate and Doddridge says it is necessary for the soul. If I try to meditate, my mind just goes or roads. Well, never mind meditation, her friend said. Go and work, for that's what God means us to do. 
and she followed his advice. Of her introduction to the fields of higher literature, we have one reminiscence. Her spirit was so eager, she read so much and so quickly, that a friend sought to test her by lending her Sartre Restartis. She carried it home, and when next he met her, he asked quizzically how she had got on with Carlyle. It is grand, she replied. I sat up reading it, and it was so interesting that I did not know what the time was until I heard the factory bells calling me to work in the morning. There was no restraining her after that. She broadened and deepened in thought and outlook, and gradually acquired the art of expressing herself, both in speech and writing, in language that was deft, lucid, and vigorous. Her style was formed insensibly from her constant reading of the Bible, and had then a grave dignity and balance unlike the more picturesque, if looser, touch of later years. The pages that were read from her at the Fellowship Association were marked by a felicity of phrase as well as an insight and spiritual fervor unusual in a girl. Her alertness of intellect often astonished those who heard her engaged in argument with the agnostics and free thinkers whom she encountered in the course of her visiting. She spoke simply, but with a directness and sincerity that arrested attention. Often asked to address meetings in other parts of Dundee, she shrank from the ordeal. On one occasion a friend went with her, but she could not be persuaded to go on the platform. She sat in the middle of the hall and had a quiet talk on the words, The common people heard him gladly. And, writes her friend, the common people heard her gladly, and crowded round her and pleaded that she should come again. Chapter 6 a tragic land. There was never a time when Mary was not interested in foreign missions. The story of Calabar had impressed her imagination when a child, and all through the years her eyes had been fixed on the great struggle going on between the forces of light and darkness in the sphere of heathenism. The United Presbyterian Church in which she was brought up placed the work abroad in the forefront of its activity. It had missions in India, China, Jamaica, Calabar, and Gafaria, and reports of the operations were given month by month in its missionary record, and read in practically all the homes of its members. It was pioneer work, and the missionaries were perpetually in the midst of adventure and peril. Their letters and narratives were eagerly looked for. They gave to people who had never traveled visions of strange lands. They brought to them the scent and color of the Orient and the tropics and they introduced into the quietude of orderly homes the din at the bazaar. These men and women in the far outpost became heroic figures to the church, and whenever they returned on furlough the people thronged to their meetings to see for themselves the actors in such amazing happenings, and to hear from their own lips the story of their difficulties and triumphs. Mrs. Slusser never missed hearing those who came to Dundee. And once she was so much moved by an address from the Reverend William Anderson as to the needs of old Calabar that she longed to dedicate her son John to the work. He was a gentle lad, much loved by Mary. Apprenticed to a blacksmith, his health began to fail, and a change of climate became imperative. He immigrated to New Zealand, but died a week after landing. His mother felt the blow to her hopes even more than his death. To Mary, the event was a bitter grief and it turned her thoughts more directly to the mission field. Could she fill her brother's place? Would it be possible for her ever to become a missionary? The idea floated for a time through her mind, unformed and unconfessed, until it gradually resolved itself into a definite purpose. Sometimes she thought of Kefaria, with its red blanketed people, but it was always Calabar to which she came back. It had from the first captivated her imagination, as it, for good reason, captivated the imagination of the church. The founding of the mission had been a romance. It was not from Scotland that the impulse came, but from Jamaica in the West Indies. The slave population of that colony had been brought from the West Coast, and chiefly from the Calabar region. And although ground remorselessly in the mill of plantation life, they had never forgotten their old home. When emancipation came and they settled down in freedom under the direction and care of the missionaries, their thoughts went over the ocean to their fatherland, and they longed to see it also enjoy the blessings which the gospel had brought to them. The agents of the Scottish Missionary Society and of the United Secession Church, who together formed the Jamaican Presbytery, talked over the matter and resolved to take action, 
and eight of their number dedicated themselves for the service they have called upon. A society was formed, and a fund was established, to which the people contributed liberally. But the officials at home were cold. They deprecated so uncertain a venture in a pestilential climate. The Presbytery, undaunted, persevered with its preparations, and chose the Reverend Hope M. Waddell to be the first agent of the society. It is a far cry from Jamaica to Calabar, but a link of communication was provided in a remarkable way. Many years previously, a slaver had been wrecked in the neighborhood of Calabar. The surgeon on board was a young medical man named Ferguson, and he and his crew were treated with kindness by the natives. After a time, they were able by another slaver to sail for the West Indies, whence Dr. Ferguson returned home. He became surgeon on a trader between Liverpool and Jamaica, making several voyages and becoming well known in the colony. Settling down in Liverpool, he experienced a spiritual change and became a Christian. He was interested to hear of the movement in Jamaica, and remembered with gratitude the friendliness shown him by the Calabar natives. He undertook to find out whether they would accept a mission. This he did through captains of the trading vessels to whom he was hospitable. In 1848, a memorial from the local king and seven chiefs were sent to him, offering ground and a welcome to any missionaries who might care to come. This settled the matter. Mr. Waddell sailed from Jamaica to Scotland to promote and organize the undertaking. Happily, the Secession Church adopted the Calabar scheme, and after securing funds and a ship, one of first subscriptions, it is necessary to note, was £1,000 from Dr. Ferguson. Mr. Waddell, with several assistants, sailed in 1846, and after many difficulties, which he conquered with an indomitable spirit and patience, in the following year it was taken over by the United Presbyterian Church, which had been formed by the Union of the United Secession and Relief Churches. In no part of the foreign field were conditions more formidable. Calabar exhibited the worst side of nature and of man. While most of it was beautiful, it was one of the most unhealthy spots in the world, sickness, disease, and swift death attacking the Europeans who ventured there. The natives were considered to be the most degraded of any in Africa. They were, in reality, the slum dwellers of the land. From time immemorial, their race had occupied the equatorial region of the continent, a people without a history, with only a past of confused movement, oppression, and terror. They seem to have been visited by adventurous navigators of galleys before the Christian era, but the world in general knew nothing of them. On the land side they were shut in without hope of expansion. When they endeavored to move up to the drier Sahara and Sudanese regions, they were met and pressed back by the outpost of the higher civilizations of Egypt and Arabia, who preyed upon them, crushed them, enslaved them in vast numbers. And just as the colored folk of American cities are kept in the low-lying and least desirable localities, and as the humbler classes in European towns find a home in eastern tenements, so all that was weakest and poorest in the race gravitated to the jungle areas and the poisonous swamps of the coast, where, hemmed in by their pathless sea, they existed in unbroken isolation for ages. It was not until the fifteenth century that the exploration of the Portuguese opened up the coast, then, to the horrors of the internal slave trade, was added the horror of the traffic for the markets of the West Indies in America. Calabar provided the slavers with their richest freight. The lands behind were decimated and desolated, and scenes of tragedy and suffering unspeakable were enacted on land and sea. Yet for four hundred years Europeans never penetrated more than a few miles inland. Away in the far interior of the continent great kingdoms were known to exist, but all the vast coastal region was a mystery of rivers, swamps, and forests inhabited by savages and wild beasts. It is not surprising that when the missionaries arrived in Calabar they found the natives to have been demoralized, degraded by the long period of lawlessness through which they had passed. They characterized them in a way that was appalling. Many seemed indeed to have difficulty in selecting words expressive enough for their purpose. Bloody. Savage crafty, cruel, treacherous, sensual, devilish, thievish, cannibals, fetish worshippers, murderers, were a few of the words applied to them by men accustomed to observe closely and to weigh their words. Not an attractive people to work amongst. Neither must the dwellers of the earth have appeared to Christ when he looked down from heaven, ere he took his place in their midst. And Mary Slusser shrank from nothing which she thought her master would have done. 
She rather welcomed the hardest task, and considered it an honor and privilege to be given them to do. She was not blind to the conditions at home. Often when in the mission she realized how great was the need of the slums, with the problems of poverty and irreligion and misery. But the people there were within sight of church spires, and with hearing of church bells, and there were many workers as capable as she. Whilst down in the slums of Africa there were millions who knew no more of the repentive power of Christ than did the beasts of the field. She was too intelligent a student of the New Testament not to know that Christ meant his disciples to spread his gospel throughout the world, and too honest not to realize that the command was laid upon everyone who loved him in spirit and in truth. It was therefore with a quiet and assured mind that she went forward to the realization of the dream. She told no one. She shrank even from mentioning the matter to her mother, but patiently prepared for the coming change. In the factory, she took charge of two sixty-inch looms. Hard work for a young woman, but she needed the money, and she never thought of toil if her object could be gained. Early in 1874, the news of the death of Dr. Livingston stirred the land. It was followed by a wave of missionary enthusiasm, and the call for workers for the dark continent thrilled many a heart. It thrilled Mary Slusser into action. She reviewed the situation. Her sisters were now in good situations, and she saw her way to continue her share in the support of the home. What this loyal determination implied she did not guess then, but it was to have a large share in shaping her life. Broaching the subject to her mother, she obtained a glad consent. One or two of her church friends were lukewarm. Others, like Mr. Logic and Mr. Smith, encouraged her. The former, who was deeply interested in foreign missions, and soon afterwards became a member of the Foreign Mission Committee, promised to look after her affairs during her sojourn abroad. In May 1875, she offered her services to the Foreign Mission Board. Her heart was set on Calabar, but so eager was she to be accepted that she said she would be willing to go to any other field. Women agents had long been engaged in Calabar. The first, Miss Miller, had gone out with Mr. Waddell in 1849 she became the Mammy Sutherland. Requests had just been made for additions to the staff. The application was, therefore, opportune. Her personality and the accounts given of her character and work made such an impression on the officials that they reported favorably to the board, and she was accepted as a teacher for Calabar and told to continue her studies in Dundee. In December, it was decided to bring her to Edinburgh at the expense of the board for three months for special preparation. The night before she left Dundee, in March 1876, she stood, a tearful figure, at the mouth of the close where she lived. Goodbye, she said to her friend, and passionately, pray for me. Chapter 7 The Three Marys A stranger in Edinburgh, Mary Slusser turned instinctively to Darling's Temperance Hotel, which was then, and is still, looked upon as a home by travelers from all parts of the globe. The Darlings, who were associated with all good work, were then taking part in the revival movement of Messrs. Moody and Sankey, and the two daughters, Bella and Jane, were solo singers at the meetings. The humble Dundee girl had heard of their powers, and she entered the hotel as if it were a shrine. Feeling very lonely and very shy, she attended the first gathering for worship which is held every evening, and was comforted and strengthened. She found a lodging in the home of Mr. Robert Martin, a city missionary, connected with Bristow Street Congregation, and formed a friendship with his daughter Mary. By her she was taken to visit a companion, Mary Doak, who lived in the South Side. The three became intimates, and shortly afterward Miss Slusser went to live with the Dogs, and remained with them during her stay in the city. It was a happy event for her. Warm-hearted and sympathetic, they treated her as one of the family. A daughter, who was married, Mrs. Crindell, also met her, and a lifelong affection sprang up between the two. In later days it was to Mrs. Crindell's home the tired missionary first came on her furloughs. Though she attended the normal school and the Canongate, she was not enrolled as a regular student, and her name does not appear in the books, but a memory of her presence lingers like a sweet fragrance, and she appears to have been a power for good. One who was a student with her says, she had a most gracious and winning personality, and impressed the students by her courage in going to what was called the white man's grave. Her reply to questioners was that Calabar was the post of danger, 
and was therefore the post of honour. Few would volunteer for service there. Hence she wished to go, for it was there the master needed her. The beauty of her character showed itself in her face, and I have rarely seen one which showed so plainly that the love of God dwelt within. It was always associated in my mind with that of Mrs. Angelica Fraser. A heavenly radiance seemed to emanate from both. Her leisure hours were given up to miscellaneous mission work in the city. Mary Doug and Mary Martin were both connected with Bristow Street Congregation, and worked in the mission at Cohen's Close, Cross Causeway, and they naturally took Mary Slothser with them. Another intimate friendship was formed with Miss Paxton, a worker in connection with South Gray's Close Mission in the High Street. Miss Paxton was standing at the entrance to the Close one Sunday, after a meeting, when Miss Slusser passed by with Mr. Bishop, who afterward became the printer at Calabar. Mr. Bishop introduced her. "'You want someone to help you,' he said. "'You cannot do better than take Miss Slusser.' The two were kindred spirits, and Mary was soon at home among Miss Paxton's classes. Her first address to the women stands out clearly in the memory of her friend, and is interesting as indicating her standpoint then and throughout her life. It was on the question, What shall I do with Jesus? She told them that Christ was standing before them as surely as he stood before Pilate, and very earnestly she went on, Dear woman, you must do something with him. You must reject him, or you must accept him. What are you going to do? She gave them no vision of hellfire. She spoke to their reason and judgment, putting the great issue before them as a simple proposition, clear as light, and left them to decide for themselves. Her two companions soon came under her influence. Their culture, piety, and practical gifts seemed to mark them out for missionaries, and as a result of her persuasion, they offered themselves to the Foreign Mission Committee of the Church, and were accepted for China. In July, the committee satisfied itself with regard to Miss Lesser's proficiency, and decided to send her out at once to Calabar. Her salary was fixed at sixty pounds. Before sailing for their different stations, the three Marys, as they came to be known, attended many meetings together, and were a source of interest to the church. Miss Lesser was now twenty-eight years of age, a type of nature characteristic of Scotland, the result of its godly motherhood, the severe discipline of its social conditions, its stern toil, its warm church life, its missionary enthusiasm. Mature in mind and body, she retained the freshness of girlhood, was vicarious and sympathetic, and while aglow with spirituality, was very human and likable, with a heart as tender and wistful as a child. What especially distinguished her, says one who knew her well, were her humility and the width and depth of her love. With diffidence, but in high hope, she went forward to weave the pattern of her service in the mission field. She sailed on August 5, 1876. Two Dundee companions went with her to Liverpool. At the docks, they saw going on board the steamer Ethiopia, by which she was to travel, a large number of casks of spirit for the west coast. Scores of casks, she exclaimed ruefully, and only one missionary. <laughs> 